Mr. Nagus. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Ray, uh, first I want to say thank you for your testimony and I want to thank you as well for your service to our country. Uh, several years ago, as you might be aware, a young man named Elijah McClain died in Colorado, my state, after being placed into two chokeholds by police officers and then being administered ketamine by paramedics during an arrest. Nearly one year ago, on June 30th of 2020, the Colorado U.S. Attorney's Office, the Department of Justice, and the Denver Division of the FBI announced that in 2019 they had begun reviewing the facts of this case for potential federal civil rights investigation. And I'll quote from their statement. They said, quote, the standard practice of the DOJ is to not disclose the existence or progress of investigations. However, there are specific cases in which doing so is warranted if such information is in the best interest of the public and public safety. Recent attention on the death of Elijah McClain warrants such disclosure, end quote. Uh, given that statement, Director Ray, can you confirm whether the DOJ has opened up a federal civil rights investigation into this matter? I would need to consult with the department about what information we can provide in response to that question, but I'm happy to have my staff circle back to you after we've done that. Thank you. I appreciate that, Director Ray, and, and uh, we'll follow up with your team. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Mr. McLean was administered the ketamine by EMS personnel. Uh, in your opinion, are there any acceptable non-medical reasons for law enforcement officers to administer or encourage attending EMS personnel to use sedatives or other medications to subdue a person under arrest? I'm really not comfortable trying to answer a, a hypothetical that cuts across such a broad range of possible scenarios. Um, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to um, decline to really offer much on that particular subject. I'm not sure I'm the right person to speak to it. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Director Ray. I would I'd simply say, in my opinion, it's, it's not acceptable for law enforcement to administer EMS personnel to be administering ketamine to subdue a person under arrest outside of a hospital setting. And it's why uh, we'll be introducing legislation to ensure that ketamine is used for medical purposes only and not as a tool of restraint. And we'll look forward to working with the FBI and other law enforcement agencies on that legislation. I want to turn to a different topic, which uh, my colleague Representative Cicilline touched on uh, earlier, you'll recall, uh, Director Ray, uh, during the morning in a portion of today's hearing, which is the epidemic of gun violence in America. On March 22nd of this year, a gunman killed 10 people, including a police officer, at a grocery store in my district in Boulder, Colorado allegedly using an AR-15 style pistol, which fired rifled rounds and had been modified with an arm brace. The AR pistol brace attachment, as you know, allows a shooter to fire an easily concealable pistol with rifle-like accuracy and firepower. And I would like you, Dr. Ray, uh, if you might, to describe in your view how these types of weapons, these short-barreled rifles, can pose additional risk to law enforcement and ultimately to the community. Well, I uh, appreciate the question, Congressman. I, I think, uh, to, first, just to be clear, I, I don't want to be weighing in on specific legislative proposals, but from a law enforcement perspective, uh, and of course, there are a variety of different types of, of high-powered or high-capacity type weapons that are out there. Uh, those are uh, things that can be of particular concern to any time there's a, uh, an operation that law enforcement is conducting. It's something that we have to be particularly mindful of. I and mean, of course, this hits particularly close to home for me and for us at the FBI because the two special agents that I mentioned in my opening, Laura Schwarzenberg and Dan Alfin, uh, were shot and killed by an individual um, a child pornography uh, subject uh, using an AR style weapon. Uh, he killed those two agents uh, and injured uh, four others uh, who thankfully have survived. So it's an illustration of how the wrong weapon in the wrong hands um, is something that we should all be deeply concerned about. Well, I appreciate that, Director Ray, and, and we certainly grieve and mourn uh, with you uh, for uh, the agents that you've lost and, and for their families. Uh, and we recognize their, their great sacrifice and service to our country. And I share your concern, and I think many here on Capitol Hill do as well. It's why uh, the Biden administration's decision, at least with respect to the uh, short barreled rifles and assault pistols regulations that they have now, uh, the president has asked uh, the ATF uh, to uh, issue. I joined the president and Attorney General Garland at a press conference uh, not that long ago, about seven weeks ago, regarding that step. I think it was an important step and moves us in the right direction, but there's clearly other steps that we need to take as a Congress to ensure that these weapons of war 
uh, are not in our community so that we can keep uh, the entire community, including members of law enforcement safe. And with that, I thank you again, Director Ray, and I would yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Christopher Ray was flat out lying right there. And the, and the fact is, uh, he is an incompetent director. He was not qualified for this job. I think I'm you know, a huge Trump supporter, but I think it was one of the biggest mistakes uh, of the Trump presidency was putting Christopher Ray in there. And uh, I think he showed it, especially in this, his opening remarks that he made today, how biased he actually is. Because everything that he said, especially about extremist violence, was completely sided to the left. Everything that had to do with any type of group that calls themselves patriots or anything that happened on January 6th was noted and, and displayed by his language as something that is far extreme with very little, if any, people that were there that, to be peaceful. And he made it sound as though the left is mostly peaceful with just a few things. Everything that comes out of this guy's mouth is pushed to the left, but it's subtle. So if you've been you know, a prosecutor or a, a U.S. attorney, or if you've been in the FBI and you listen to his language, you can literally see this. And I, I, and I think some of these congressmen and congresswomen actually saw this today, and I think they went after him, but he's not going to bend as far as that goes. I will tell you that I have spoken directly to FBI agents that are investigating January 6th, you know, um, issues, and ranging from individuals that uh, were in the Capitol to individuals who were not in the Capitol. One, one thing that stands out, the, the, the most recent conversation I had with an FBI, FBI agent here in Salt Lake indicated he said he's never seen anything like this. They are given a mandate. They are to go out. They have been given the questions they're supposed to be asking. They have been given the way they're supposed to proceed on this case. They don't have individualized authority. It is all coming from Washington, D.C. I've spoken to prosecutors that are prosecuting these cases. And this is not individualized justice. They are lumping everybody into the same category, and they are treating them uh, like, un unlike I've ever seen in a case. Uh, the Department of Justice is supposed to address every single case, unless it's a conspiracy case, according to the criminal conduct of that individual. They're not doing that. None of the prosecutors mm. have authority. It's all coming straight from Washington, D.C., there is so much energy put towards these people, and there's not the same energy put towards Antifa. Why didn't he explain that? Why couldn't he explain that? Well, I don't think he could explain it because, again, he was making this into uh, more of a political uh, stand. And, you know, he, he said there were three categories of people on January 6th. He failed to completely mention the people who were literally invited into uh, the Capitol building by the, the Capitol Police. And the majority of the people that were there did nothing. It, he made it sound as though if you came on the Capitol grounds, you were an extremist. And that is just not the case. There were some violent people there. There were some people that went into the Capitol that did some very nefarious things. But his category, uh, the way he categorized these people was absolutely wrong. And the way that the FBI has systematically as uh, Brett just uh, pointed out there, been told how to investigate January 6th, they've systematically been kept from truly investigating or going after the leftists. And that is so clear because of the way that there's just nothing going down about these individuals on the left. And I'll, I'll just say one other thing. In all my time in the FBI, the only white supremacist case that I ever saw, and I was in New York the entire time, was prison-related. There was no white supremacy, uh, massive uh, agenda going on in the United States, and it's not happening now. And it's another example of how they use these things and push them out in the media. When you think about what Antifa did last summer, the number of federal properties that they destroyed um, or defaced, and the money that they caused to small businesses, the, the, the police officers who they injured, the Secret Service members, they really haven't been held accountable to the same type of behavior that they did all last summer. Why not? They have not been. I mean, you think about what domestic terrorism is. When you burn down a police station and you take over city blocks, that's domestic terrorism. And they have not been held accountable. Uh, I'm ashamed to, to say that, you know, my, my former office, you know, the Department of Justice, I, I wish I could see courage. I wish I, I could see U.S. attorneys standing up. You know, it's interesting. I, I represent an individual who... Um, went into the Capitol, um, was told she could go in. 
and was actually pointed by a security guard to the direction she should go. And she's being prosecuted. She's being charged with uh, misdemeanors. She, she has no criminal history. She thought the only other capital she's ever been in is a state capital that's open 24 seven. She thought you could walk in. She, so there's a, there's a wide disparity a, a, between you know, who Chris Ray is identifying and they wanna prosecute every single person that was there to send a message. And that's what this is, it's message prosecuting. And, and, and that's mm -hmm. never a, a, an appropriate decision by a prosecutor.